so with that, uh, I'll welcome you to the Brown Bag Seminar. It's jointly hosted by the Delta Science Program, the Ecosystem Restoration Program, and the Surface Water Ambient Monitoring Program. And this is the first one of the new year, and we're very happy to have Laura Velopi here to talk about adaptive management in action from her experience with the South San Francisco Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project. So Laura is um, a, a USGS employee, but she is the lead scientist for the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project. And she has extensive experience with biological resources, water quality, and grants management. Um, Laura got her BS from the University of Michigan and her master's at UC Davis. Uh, she previously worked with the US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, uh, focusing on environmental contaminant and oil spill cases, uh, including the Montrose Natural Resource Damage Assessment Trial. And she also worked on species conservation plans. Um, before that, she worked for about 10 years, I believe, with the state of California as a toxicologist. And in the past, she's also served as president and vice president of the Northern California chapter of the Society of Environmental Chemistry and Toxicology. So with that, I'd like to welcome Laura. Can you all hear? Good. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a different area than what most of you are used to living, um, uh, focusing on. Let's see if we have that. All right. So this is the project area. It's in South San Francisco Bay, home to Silicon Valley. And the goals of our project are to restore wildlife habitat, to provide recreation for the four plus million people in the South Bay, seven million in the entire San Francisco Bay, and also flood protection for Silicon Valley. I'm going to focus on the restoration aspect of this. So as many of you know, um, historically the South Bay, the entire bay, had much more tidal marsh habitat um, existing than is today. And you can see that in particular in South Bay, there was a lot of this green here, which is tidal marsh, showing the extensive um, acreage of tidal marsh habitat. Also notice the brown. This is um, mudflat habitat, which is also very prominent in the South Bay, and that'll become apparent later as I, I go through my talk. And this is today's uh, version. Um, you can see the, a lot of the brown is still there, a lot of the mudflat habitat is still there, but the green is now pink, and the pink signifying um, salt production. So it was salt marsh habitat, and then it was converted over the last 100 and 150 years to be diked off. Um, the marsh was diked off, and then these um, evaporative uh, salt ponds were put in. This is the area today, um, the project area. This is San Mateo Bridge, Dumbarton Bridge, and then Silicon Valley. <clears throat> so we have three complexes that make up the project. One is Eden Landing, and that's owned and operated by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And then the Ravenswood complex here, oops, where did my little cursor go? I think I lost my cursor. The Ravenswood complex, um, is, is uh, owned and operated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as part of the Don Edwards San Francisco Bay National Wildlife Refuge, and then the Elviso Complex down here is also part of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service National Wildlife Refuge. The gray areas here and here are still under salt production, so that's not part of the 15,000 acres. The 15,000 acres are in Eden Landing, Ravenswood, and Elviso. <clears throat> and that area is about the size of Manhattan to give you some perspective. So the land was acquired in 2003. Um, it was a public-private partnership. A total cost of, to purchase the land was $100 million, and it was purchased by the state of California, the U.S. government, and then a consortium of Silicon Valley-based foundations. After the acquisition, then a whole group of people um, on the screen came together to, to start the restoration project, even though the owners of the property were U.S. Fish and Wildlife and Cal Fish and Wildlife. Um, a, a whole other group of people needed to come in to uh, have the, reservation, uh, the, the restoration implemented. So why are we doing this? Well, as the first picture showed, you know, a lot of the habitat has been lost. A lot of the marsh habitat has been lost. And many of those uh, marsh species are now threatened and endangered primarily because of the loss of habitat. 
And the conversion of these salt ponds back to marsh is critical for the recovery of these species. In particular, the Ridgeways Rail, which was formerly called the California Clapper Rail, and the Salt Marsh Harvest Mouse, their recovery plans are very dependent upon having this area converted back to tidal marsh. But we also have uh, all the ponds now are open water ponds. They were historically even when they were salt production ponds. And when they were salt production ponds, and even today, uh, several uh, hundreds of thousands of water birds, ducks and shorebirds use these open water areas. Um, and it's key habitat for migratory and um, wintering birds that come through the area. Um, it's on the Pacific Flyway. And it's also particularly important for shorebirds, that mudflat habitat, those brown areas that I showed you in that first map, um, is very critical habitat, foraging habitat for um, shorebirds. And for the most part, the ducks and the shorebirds and the other water birds don't really use the vegetated marsh. So we have to try and retain as much of the managed ponds or open water habitat to support, continue to support these water birds that have come in in the last 100 plus years but we also want to convert as many as possible to um, marsh. So there's sort of two different alternatives. One is sort of a managed pond emph emphasis where we might have about half of the ponds as this managed pond or open water pond in blue, and then about another half as tidal marsh, which is in green. This is just a, an example, one of the scenarios. Or if we can figure out a way to put those hundreds of thousands of birds in a smaller footprint, in a smaller number of ponds, then we can convert more of those ponds to tidal marsh habitat. And that version is sort of shown in um, the green, in this uh, right-hand side, with green being tidal marsh and blue being a uh, managed pond. So this is another way to look at it. We figure it's gonna take about 50 years to restore and enhance these 15,000 acres. The amount of tidal marsh is on the y-axis here. The idea is over time we're going to slowly open up these ponds to tidal marsh and study the effects, see what happens. The environmental documents indicate that we can convert as much as 50% to tidal marsh without adversely impacting the water birds, but we would like, we would like to be able to convert up to 90% to tidal marsh, but that means we have to enhance that 10% of ponds very highly so that we can fit that large number of birds into a smaller footprint. And this is yet another way to look at it. This is just showing that what we've done here is we've broken the restoration up into phases. So we do a, you know, a couple thousand acres in phase one, study the effects, and then take that information and bring it into phase two, do some more actions, study those effects, move into stage uh, phase three, et cetera. And so this is over time and then the amount of acres restored. So we're right about here now. We're just finishing up our last phase one restoration action and we've um, completed our phase two environmental documents. The, the final EIR, EIS should be coming out shortly. So, um, and then just, this is the adaptive management cycle. So you plan, you have an idea of what you wanna do, a restoration action or an enhancement project. You implement that project, you monitor it, you might do some fine tuning in the middle as you need it, and I'll provide some examples of how we did that. And then you've, um, you evaluate the monitoring results, maybe bring in new data on that species or, or other factors, and then you start the whole cycle again. You plan, implement, monitor, evaluate. So in our, this, in phase one, that's what we did. We did that cycle. Um, plan, implement, monitor, evaluate. We've moved, we've learned those lessons. We've moved in, we're moving into phase two. We're gonna plan, implement, monitor, evaluate again, and we'll do that in phase three on up the cycle. So because we have 15,000 acres, we have, we can bite it off into small bits and restore a couple thousand acres at a time and, and rather than trying to do the whole 15,000 acres. So, Adaptive management is only possible if you have science support to track the changes. And we have a very strong applied science, um, applied research project. And the science support is provided by U.S. Geological Survey um, employees, but it's also provided by academic, uh, nonprofit, and consultant scientists. So we have a multidisciplinary team. 
And some, several key uncertainties were evaluated in the environmental documents. The first is, will, will there be enough sediments to fill the pond? So some of the areas, particularly in the far south bay, have subsided. There was some groundwater pumping historically that was unrelated to the salt pond productions that um, subsided the land surface. So we need to bring up some of the elevation in several of the ponds up to um, eight or 10 feet. Once those ponds are elevation is increased, the elevation is high enough that plant material that comes in can um, take hold and colonize. But with that, all that sediment coming into the newly breached areas, we don't want erosion of the mudflats to be a consequence of that. And so we have um, uncertainties about what impacts will the restoration have on the mudflat habitat? And recall that that mudflat habitat is really a key resource for foraging shorebirds, so we don't want to lose that. And then in general, how will the restoration affect birds? As I said, the key uncertainty is how to fit a small number of water bird, or a large number of water birds on a smaller footprint. So that's a, a definite um, focus of a lot of our studies. And then we also want to see how the the restoration benefits other species like uh, like fish species and other aquatic species. We have some nuisance species that I'll talk about. Um, and then we have a legacy mercury problem. The, as you know from working in the Delta, the entire San Francisco Bay Delta has a mercury problem. But we have a particular um, enhanced problem because there is a large mercury mine upstream of one of our large complexes that has washed uh, contaminated sediment at high levels into the, into the project area. And then we want people to use this area for recreation, um, but we don't want to do it in a way that might adversely impact wildlife, so we have some studies on that. And then how to manage um, water quality. The ponds were designed to hold water, and we're trying to push water through, but because of the shallowness of the ponds and the large eggs area and the warm conditions in the summer in the San Francisco, in the South Bay, we often get water quality problems, dissolved oxygen um, decreases and fish kills in the South Bay. And then of course we're concerned with how climate change and sea level rise might affect the area that we're restoring. So first I'm gonna talk about sediment. As I said, there are some subsided areas. Um, even in the areas that weren't subject to um, groundwater pumping, the fact that they've been cut off from a sediment supply for a century or more means that they have um, subsided. So almost all the ponds need some kind of sub sediment subsidy. So we're interested in the sediment supply coming into the South Bay. Will we have enough sediment? Um, that's sort of on a macro level. And then on a micro level, we're concerned with as we breach an individual pond, what's the sediment accumulation within that pond? And then of course, we're concerned with the scour of mudflat habitats as a result of that sediment coming into the ponds. And then with that sediment is also some contaminated mercury. So there's um, that aspect of the sediment dynamics as well. So um, we undertook some studies. This is the far south bay. This is Dumbarton Bridge. They um, investigated, they looked at sediment flux coming through this Dumbarton Narrows here underneath the bridge as well as um, sediment coming in from the Guadalupe River and Coyote Creek, which are the two main tributaries into South Bay. And this is showing the results for the first three years. This is sediment flux in kilotons on the y-axis. Positive numbers mean that the net sediment flux is seaward or away from our project area. Negative numbers mean that there's a net sediment flux toward our project area into South Bay. The red is what is coming through tidally on the, on the, in the Dumbarton Bridge, through the Dumbarton Bridge. And then the blue is what is coming in from the tributaries. And basically you see in 2009, we had 220 kilotons of sediment coming into South Bay. Very little was contributed by the tributaries and, and even less by the wastewater treatment plants. The following year in 2010, it was kind of a net zero. Not much came in um, through the Dumbarton uh, narrows, more came into the tributaries, but overall very little net sediment accumulated in the South Bay. In 2011, we had just the reverse. We had 440 kilotons of sediment moving out of South Bay, so twice as much as went in in this 2009 went out in 2011. 
And we think the scientists are still investigating this, but they think because it was because water year um, 2011 was a very wet year and there's some dynamics with salinity that may have caused this to occur. We think it's a rather, it's an anomaly. We've been studying this for the last um, couple of years and they're still analyzing the data. So I don't have those results yet. But it does look like the preliminary data suggests that the uh, wet water year of 2011 was an anomaly. Now with an El Nino, it'll be interesting to see what happens there as well. Um, but keep that in mind that um, they use our error bars. Yes, yes. So there is a lot of uncertainty when you've got, you know, 440 kilotons um, and you're trying to track that, it's not, it's not easy. So now I'm gonna, that, so that was what was coming through into South Bay. Did that answer your question? Because they're, me they're measuring the sediment over a long period of time. So they're getting multiple measurements. And they're, um, we'll, we'll talk about it at the end. At the end. Um, anyway, so, um, we also looked at sediment accumulation in some individual ponds that we breached. So uh, the first set of ponds that we breached were in 2006. This is called the Island Ponds. And then the second set of ponds, the second pond that we breached was this duck's head. It looks kind of like a grebe or a duck's head looking to the west. So we call it um, a duck pond. It's technically called Pond A6. So first I'm going to talk about the sediment accumulation in the, duck, in the uh, Island Ponds, and then we'll go to the duck's head. But first I want to talk about how these ponds are restored. So this is Pond A21, one of the island ponds. They created the salt production ponds by taking a big scoop, digging up part of the marsh, and then piling it up to create a berm or a levee around a portion of a marsh. And so all of the ponds have this burrow ditch on the inside with a berm on the outside. But you can see that the, the channel, the marsh channel, habitat is still existing, the little corkscrew um, channels that create the marsh. So this is very good for our restoration. It, hydrologically, the, the marsh is intact except for the area around the burrow ditch and the berm. So the engineers come in and do some analysis, the um, hydrogeologists do an analysis, and they determine where best to breach. Usually it's near where the um, uh, existing channels are. And then some amphibious equipment comes out, or sometimes equipment comes out on a levee, depending on the situation, and it, and it breaks the, the berm um, and creates a channel, an open channel to the tide. And then the tide water rushes in, and with that tide water, it brings with it all this wonderful sediment, and then that sediment builds up the marsh, and eventually that tide brings in seeds and plant material, and that seed and plant material can then um, uh, colonize and take hold and develop the marsh. So it's all very passive restoration. So we did some um, studies looking at sediment accumulation in these ponds. This is the island pond. We found very rapid accumulation of about um, 20 centimeters in the first two to three years. That's about eight inches of sediment. That's very, very high. Usually in an existing marsh, it's a couple, it's a couple millimeters a year of, of sediment accumulation. But because the areas are subsided, there's very rapid initial sediment accumulation. And this is what part of that pond uh, looks like. Um, this was in 2008, so two years after the breach. You can see all this nice yummy sediment has come in and settled down along the channels. And then a year later, we started getting plant colonization. The elevation of the marsh had reached a, a, an elevation where it could um, start to colonize and recruit. And this is an aerial view of that. So this is that burrow ditch all the way around and then the berm around it. This is where the breaches occurred. Once the, the breaches um, occur, just natural tidal processes act to widen many of the breaches. This breach over here um, didn't widen as much for whatever reason. But you can see the, the, the corkscrew channel pattern as well as the um, green showing the um, development in, of the marsh. This is what it looked like last year. Um, has filled in beautifully. So this is nine years, this is 2015, nine years after it was breached. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service conducted some studies and they found uh, clapper whales, uh, evidence that clapper whales were breeding in this marsh. 
as well as salt marsh harvest mouse. So the two keystone species that use this marsh less than 10 years after, the re after we started the restoration are now utilizing this habitat. So we were very excited to see this. This is what we want to happen. The other, the other one that we looked at um, that was breached in 2010 is this duck's head, and this is kind of a close-up. There's a levee here that separates it from the lower um, ponds, but we breached it in four locations. This is about 350 acres, and then we set up these 10 um, pin locations, or red, red dots, where to track sediment accumulation. And this graph is showing time since the breach on the x-axis, with sediment accumulation on, at these pin locations on the y-axis. And you can see the different locations had varying amounts of sediment accumulation. Only one had some erosion. That was this one that was right near a breach location. But we had average depositions of very high levels, almost 43 centimeters in the first um, less than two years. That averaged about 22 centimeters per year which is about what we were getting over three years in the, in the island ponds. We're getting over just the first year um, in the second set of ponds. And this is showing the same, comparing the two sets of ponds. So this is time since breach on the x-axis and amount of sediment accumulation on the y-axis. This A6 is the duck's head. It had a lower initial elevation, so it had a higher gradient um, that could allow um, much rap more rapid rates of sediment accumulation. And then the first set of ponds, the island ponds, also had very rapid accumulation in the beginning. And then it starts reaching a plateau, and that's very typical for this sort of um, breach application. I want to direct you here, though, right in this area. This A6 pond was breached in the end of 2010, and that was, so this accumulation here is that first year, which is 2011. And if you recall that first graph I showed you, there was that 440 kilotons of sediment that was moving out of South Bay. So on a large level, there was a lot of sediment moving out of South Bay in 2011. But on a small scale, on a, on a pond scale, there's still lots of sediment in the system and there's very rapid sediment accumulation during that time. So that was encouraging to us that even though we were, we were kind of concerned that we were seeing this massive amount of sediment moving out of South Bay, there's still lots of sediment in the system to drive um, uh, the sediment accumulation that we need to build the marshes. And this is just kind of what it looks like at various periods afterward. It's developing nicely. But all this nice sediment coming into the ponds, pouring into the ponds and filling up, that makes us concerned about um, what's happening to the mudflat habitat or shoals. We estimate there's about 2,000 acres of mudflat habitat in our project area. We've tried traditional satellite imagery, but it's problematic for a lot of reasons I won't go into. So we're starting a, we started last year a pilot study using Worldview 2. It's a certain, just a certain satellite with this coastal blue band, which penetrates water a little bit better than some of the traditional ones. We also included some ground truthing. This is just an example showing it that um, this, uh, this picture is from the Worldview 2 satellite imagery, and this green line is some uh, very um, high-resolution bathymetry data, side-scan sonar bathymetry data that we got. And you can see it lined up very well. So that was encouraging to us that we might be able to use this Worldview 2 in a more cost-effective way over a large area. So, so far we don't think that we're eroding the mudflat habitats, but it's early in the restoration yet, and that's something that we want to keep an eye on. And we're hoping that this technique will help us do that. So I'm going to switch and talk about, that's the mud. Now I'm going to switch and talk about birds, which as I said, was a real focus of our project. The first phase especially, we focused on a lot of habitat, bird habitat enhancement projects, and I'll go through those and talk about kind of the successes and the not so um, wonderful things that happened. So we have over 40 species of birds, shorebirds, ducks, um, diving ducks like uh, uh, the grebe here, pelicans. Um, we have some breeding birds. Most of the birds, however, are coming through in the, staying in the winter or coming through in the fall and spring migration. So the first habitat, bird habitat project we tried was this pond SF2 here near um, Menlo Park in Palo Alto. And so we, the engineers created um, uh, a set of 30 ponds by kind of scooping out 
the mud of the pond when it was dry and then piling it up to create these islands. And this is sort of the overhead view. So you see we had 15 linear islands and 15 round islands. We didn't know which, side, which shape of island the birds would um, prefer, so we did both. And this is sort of looking at it going to the west here. There's two different cells that have the islands in them. The water comes in into this intake structure. There's a series of water control structures along here that allows flow toward the southeast, and then the water outflows here. And there's several water control structures that can control the depth of the water and the timing of the water. And this is what this looks like when we add water. Here's the exposed um, mounds, islands. And then the deeper green, darker green, are the deeper areas where we were created the borrow area to create the ponds. And then this is the um, pond surface elevation that it was originally. So we have sort of dry habitat, deep, deeper water habitat, and then shallower habitat. So the first year, we, we, breached it, we opened it up in 2010, fall of 2010. The first year, we looked at nesting, and we were very impressed to see that there, was over 100, there were 193 bird nests. Almost all of the islands were being used by nesting birds. Most of the nests that were occurring in this pond were on the islands, with a few on other locations. So we thought, this is wonderful. Well, unfortunately, if you've ever been in the bay, the bay mud, when it dries out, it cracks. So on top of these islands where it was drying out, several cracks had formed, and unfortunately we lost some of the chicks. In, they perished in these cracks. They fell in and couldn't get out, and the parents couldn't get them out. Not what we had intended. But that's adaptive management. Things don't always work out the way you want. And this is just showing some of the cracks. They were quite large. So the refuge brought in this marsh master, and it basically, it's an amphibious piece of equipment. We didn't have to drain the ponds. They could just, you know, bring it in, bring it across the, the surface of the pond, and then go onto each of the different islands. And they roughed up the surface to try and break up those, um, the surface to eliminate the cracks. And this is sort of what it looked like, kind of bumpy, but after the rains came, it would smooth it out a bit. And so we were anxious to see what would happen in the second year. In the second year, um, we only got 68 nests. Very few of the islands were used for nesting, only two of them. Most of the nesting occurred back in this area here, which is this area that was kept dry for snowy plovers. So we don't know if the birds avoided this area for nesting because of the prior year cracks. There were also some nuisance species like California gull that were using these areas that might have um, uh, dissuaded the birds and the shorebirds from nesting in this area. We weren't quite sure. But the net results was in 2011, we had 160 avocet nest, a fairly high nest success, even given some of the um, chicks perished in the cracks. But by 2012, very limited nesting in our, on our islands. So this was a disappointment. But we did get from this SF2 pond, as well as them looking at nesting at other islands on the, on the project area, we, the uh, researchers gave us this recipe for nesting birds. So we know how far to put the islands from the bay, how far to put them from features like levees. We found out that linear islands are preferred over round. We have an idea of the size of island that the birds prefer. We know how, how high up to keep this, um, the the, to build the island, the top of the surface. And most important, they told us that fewer islands are, per pond are better. Instead of putting 30 islands in there, it's better, um, it's just it's more cost effective to put three to five islands per pond. It's not that more islands um, prevent nesting, it's just that it doesn't give you any advantage, so why spend the money? So um, this A16 was also planned as a bird enhancement area, they created 16 islands in this pond. We were in the process of building and creating this set of islands in, their pond, in the ponds prior to us having the full um, uh, results from the SF2 study, so they went ahead and put those same islands in there. The purpose of this was to try and see if an island, islands, bird nesting islands away from the bay as opposed to closer to the bay would have any difference. But basically they found that very few of these nesting islands were, um, were used, and despite all of the very first year showing high success. 
So the managers decided, okay, they're not using the islands, let's try and attract them. For certain birds like terns that are colonial nesters, you can use some of these techniques to attract birds. It's not gonna work for solitary birds, but basically um, social attraction is a single bar for birds. You put these decoys out, you know, bird, these little decoys that look like the bird that you're trying to attract. And we had these call systems that would also um, attract them. And this way we can attract the nesting birds to a specific area. And so we did that for these SF2 islands and the A16 islands that we had put all this money into constructing and they weren't using, darn them. So um, this particular, I'm just gonna go through, focus on the Caspian Turn or Kate Caspian Turn. Um, this was funded by the US Army Corps of Engineer for some mitigation in um, Puget Sound that I won't get into, but um, so three of the islands uh, were prepared, had decoys, about 50 decoys, and a call system, a solar operated call system was set up in this SF2 island, and then in A16 we set up two of the islands with Caspian turn. We also tried this to, in a limited extent for foresters turns and plovers, uh, but the focus was really for Caspian turn. The results for Caspian Turn were very successful. We had 147 nests in the three islands at SF2, producing 120 turn chicks, very good nesting success. Um, similarly at the two islands that had the social attraction in A16, lots of nesting, lots of produced birds. So we had a breeding success of about 0.79 chicks fledged per breeding pair, which was which is really pretty good. This is a this was the first year of a of a three-year study, so we have two more years. There, um, we're hoping to get some funding to um, add Forester's Turn uh, uh, decoys and call boxes and continue this Caspian Turn study. Um, we also studied the effects of these islands for wintering birds, so all that was for the nesting birds that we had, and we have a couple different species of nesting birds. And as we were investigating the island use by um, wintering birds, they found that basically the wintering birds like isolated islands at high tide, and they were mostly using it for roosting, not foraging. But sort of antidotally, we were seeing that when these islands were created by the heavy equipment coming in and scooping up the dirt to pile it up to create the nesting islands, sometimes there'd be like some remnant material that was left that hadn't quite gotten smoothed out or moved over, and it would create these very shallow mounds, um, you know, maybe a couple of centimeters water, of, of water. And the researchers were observing that the shorebirds especially really like these like shallow little mounds. So that leads me to this next set of ponds that we were trying to enhance up here at E12, whoops, E12, E13. The other, the first set was here and, and um, excuse me, here. So because this was the last pond that we were designing, we had the information from SF2 and to A16 to know that, um, you know, uh, that, uh, uh, what to do with the islands, how to design the islands. Originally, this pond was only going to have a salinity experiment in it of high, medium, and low salinity, trying to mimic more the higher salinities that were there when it was salt production, because some of the species really like that. But we also had an opportunity to redesign it to mimic this um, shallow habitat that the shorebirds favored. So we created a series of shallow channels by scooping it out scooping out shallowly the dirt, the mud, and then piling it up alongside that channel to create these shallow mounds. And so now we have an area that not only varies in salinity, but also varies with um, topography. So that means when you add water, you're gonna have different water depths as well. So you have this habitat diversity, would hopefully result in bird diversity, increased bird diversity in use. And this is basically what it looks like. So the, this is the set of E12 ponds, E13. There's a matched pair of low salinity cells, medium salinity cells, and high salinity cells. The water comes in here, it's moved through a series of water control structures so that they can um, control the amount of salinity. There's some target ranges for salinity. Um, so that was the original design. And then we added these nesting islands based on the study, that the results from the nesting survey that said only add a few nesting islands. You don't need to add 30, just add, you know, a couple. So that's what we did. Each 
each um, cell has a nesting island, and then they're linear because we learned that the birds favor linear over round. <laughs> but we also added this um, shallow water habitat, so these shallow channels, which are in blue, and then that material was piled up to create the shallow foraging mounds. So this um, experiment just really has started. Um, we're in the process of studying this, but as soon as the water was added, the birds have started to using these cells. We don't quite know, um, and they started using the foraging mounds. We're still collecting data and assessing it. So um, I'm gonna switch a little bit and talk about, um, again, birds, but nuisance birds. So this is a California gull. Historically, it had never really nested in San Francisco Bay, but or very limited nesting. <clears throat> but with some changes in uh, Mono Lake, where it had historically nested, we started seeing more and more of the California gull coming into nest in the San Francisco Bay. And you can see this exponential increase of birds of California gull. When you think, well, this is really great, right? Well, unfortunately, this gull um, has a bad habit of depredating um, shorebird nest. So it, it will take the chick or the eggs of, that, um, of those um, birds. So this is showing the California gull stealing a little chick from the avocet and the parents running after it, um, very upset, um, probably. Oh, and I should say we have data showing that these California gulls depredate not just avocets, but a number of other of the nesting birds that we're trying to enhance, including the snowy plover, which is endangered. So this brings, this part of the story brings me back to the duck's head, A6 here. This duck's head um, was dry. It was operated, instead of having water on it, it was, it was a, um, kept dry a good part of the year. It was used as a, um, a duck, for duck hunting. It was a duck hunting club. And this um, pond happened to have uh, half, 25,000 of the nesting gulls were at this one pond, so a very high concentration of gulls. We were curious to see with all these gulls scattered over this area nesting, what would happen when we breached the pond. We were hoping they would like move away and go back to Mono Lake, go someplace else and not impact our project area. So the gull, some of the, several of the gulls were banded and we observed where they were um, uh, recited. In 2010, um, most of the gulls were at A6 at this duck's head here. And you can't see it too well, but there's a couple other smaller, the orange dot, the bigger the dot, the more the gulls. The smaller the dot, the fewer the gulls. So most of them were at that duck's head. Then after we breached, this is a duck's head, they, half of them moved over to the next set of ponds, and then the other half kind of dispersed and increased at existing colonies around the bay. Uh, initially, there was a decrease in the California gull population by about 17% after we breached it. But then within one or two years, we started getting the gull population settled down and continued to increase. And right now, the last estimate is about 53,000 birds. So that's on a large scale, but on a smaller scale, this is showing the duck's head. There were, most of the California gulls were nesting in this, uh, half of them were nesting in this duck's head. At, they moved over to this next set of ponds. These ponds here had um, water in them, were kept with water in them. So they moved to the levees that were um, separating these ponds. And there was a forester's turn colony just south of this California gull colony in 2010, prior to the breaching of, that, of the, of the uh, A6 pond and flooding of the gull nests, there was only a 4% fledging success of these turns. With the movement of, with the opening up of this pond and the movement of those birds over and disbursement of, those, of the gulls, the fledging success of the turns increased 40% or an order of magnitude. So having the gulls, even though they were fairly, still fairly close by, having them further away and having fewer of them appear to benefit the turn fledging success. So that was encouraging. So even though we didn't decrease the numbers of gulls, the impacts on the shorebirds were lessened. So I wanna wrap up the bird, um, my bird discussion here with, this is showing, um, uh, can see this is the bird year. So this is starting in 2003 to 2014. This is just um, the average number of wintering birds in our project area. 
And so you can see it increased. This is the ISP, which was when we were starting to add several water control structures. There was a couple year period we were adding water control structures, starting to bring in bay water. So there was some disturbance of the areas where the birds had historically wintered. So there was a little bit of a decrease. And then this is that start of our phase one actions where we started enhancing birds, our areas for birds. We started managing the ponds more for bird use rather than salt production. And you can see there is a general increase. And overall, there's been about a doubling of um, wintering birds from the initial purchase in 2003 to 2014. So that was encouraging. But not all birds are benefiting. So uh, I mentioned the snowy plover a couple times. This is an endangered bird that historically has nested in beach habitat. But because of impacts on that beach habitat from development and people using the beach and walk, dogs walking on the beach and all that, it started to adapt to use these dry, um, dry ponds that have a salt crust on them that I guess to a plover look like a beach. And it, it nests in just this very shallow scrape on this salt. So it's very vulnerable. It's a little cotton-sized ball. It's very vulnerable to predation by things like California gull as well as a number of other predators. So we started to do a habitat enhancement project. This is at E14. It's right below that E12, E13 salinity pond that I showed you. And we had some, uh, did a pilot study showing that putting some oyster shells out created camouflage for the chicks and the nest because this nest is just a little scrape. So we got a bunch of shells and last year distributed those shells over about a 50 acre area. We had plots with shells and plots without the shell. Once the shells were dumped off this flatbed, then um, a leaf blower um, scattered the shells to about five to eight um, shells per meter squared, the same density over the, all the 50 acres. And this is kind of what it looks like um, after the shells are scattered. So we had areas with shells, areas without shells. This was the first year last year. Initially, so there was some old shells that had been put there before. The, looking at, this is the hatch rate of plovers. You can see the new shell and the old shell areas, um, the old shell areas in particular had higher hatch rates than the non-shell areas or the new shell areas. But most importantly, depredation decreased from the non-shell areas. Um, there was an increase in abandoned um, nest and we think that that might be due to there was a high density of plovers. They're more of an isolated nester, it might have been territoriality or competition that resulted in some of the nesting, nests being abandoned compared to the non-shell areas. But overall, this was a, a huge success. There was double um, the amount of hatching in the shelled areas as had been previous and far less um, depredated nests. So it does look like these shells do provide a camouflage for these plovers, and we're interested in expanding this to other areas and um, larger areas in this pond for this bird. And that's just some other data I won't go into in how much time. So I also wanted to talk about um, mercury and the mercury effects on wildlife. So the largest mercury mine in North America is upstream of one of our project areas, Guadalupe River. And so we were concerned that um, Mercury would be mobilized as we opened up the ponds, it would scour out the adjacent sloughs. Some of those sloughs, the sediments have mercury that is buried in them, so that would remobilize that mercury and distribute it in our project area or elsewhere. Um, so where would it move to? And then just what is the effect of increasing tidal action on these ponds? Is it going to increase mercury accumulation, methylation and accumulation or not? There's very complex biogeochemical processes that dictate um, how much mercury will accumulate in a bird or a fish, and it's not easy to predict. So we set up a, a mercury experiment. This is below the duck's head here. There's a levee that separates it, and this is showing um, the pond A6. This is the set of ponds I'm going to talk about now, pond A8. And then the adjacent Elviso Slough is actually connected to Guadalupe River. And upstream of Guadalupe River was the New Almaden mine that historically had washed down contaminated sediments um, that settled in our project area. And then with the rains, more sediment comes down through the upper watershed into our project area. And this is that pond, this is the duck's head. So this is 
Elviso Slough here, Guadalupe Slough. Elviso Slough connects to Guadalupe River. Um, so the idea here was let's, let's control the amount of water and the timing of the water that we put into this pond, operate it as a muted tidal flow, and then check to see what effect that has on mercury. So they put two control gates here. The water comes in, flows to the south, and then comes out of this notch here on Elviso Slough. This is the notch, it's just an armored notch, concreted notch, 40 feet wide. There's eight bays, eight um, gates that are five foot wide. So initially we just opened one gate. The idea was we would open one, two, four, you know, successive gates to see what the impact was on mercury. This is about a 1,400 acre area. We opened it in the June of 2011, but we did a backy design study before or after control impact. So we looked at um, mercury in the ponds, in the water, and in, this, in the Elviso slough in the fish, and also in this um, scouring out from the sediment um, before and after the opening of this pond, as well as comparing it pond A8 to reference locations, reference ponds, and reference sloughs. And this is just a schematic of what we saw. So with the gate closed um, in 2010, we found very high levels of mercury in pond fish and in nesting terns. This is a forester's turn. We also looked at mercury in avocet eggs, and they were not any higher than in adjacent ponds, but the turn eggs were much higher in pond A8 than in adjacent ponds, and the fish were much higher in pond A8 than adjacent ponds. We also looked at fish in the slough. They were not any higher, when the gate was closed, they were not any higher than adjacent sloughs. Once we opened that pond, we saw that the mercury in the slough fish greatly increased within the, within the first month, and the mercury in the pond fish greatly decreased within the first month or so. The turn eggs uh, mercury level stayed high because they had already finished nesting by June, and the avocet eggs didn't change. But at the end of that first season, by the fall, the mercury levels in the slough fish went down to levels comparable to what was seen in reference ponds. So originally we were very alarmed that we had such a large increase in mercury in the turn eggs, and it still is large, but it has come down considerably. We've continued to monitor it almost every year after, and it's looking very encouraging. Right now we have five gates that are open. We've able, been able to successively open the gates here, and so far the after the initial spike in mercury in turn eggs, it's decreased, and similarly with the fish. So that's encouraging. Um, more on that later. It's been a very complex series of, uh, um, of studies that I won't, go in, I won't go into all of it. I just wanted to give you a flavor of it. We're also concerned with how trails will affect wildlife. We want people to use these trails. Uh, we want the people of South San Francisco Bay to enjoy the area, but we don't want to do it at the expense of the wildlife that's there. And we're concerned with effect on breeding behavior, the nest success, foraging and roosting of wintering and migratory birds. And basically what we determined from a number of different studies is a safe distance from a trail to a habitat feature, like a nesting island or an area where birds are foraging. So the results of these trail studies were snowy plover, which is that little endangered cotton ball bird um, that nests on the dry areas, is very sensitive to any disturbance. And um, so we know that we have to keep a trail at least 164 meters away, which is about 500 feet away from um, a nesting plover habitat. We also found that wintering waterfowl were very um, sensitive, and we have a trail buffer distance of 120 meters. And uh, shorebirds were much less um, skittish, I guess is the word, um, and we have a buffer distance of 50 meters from a trail to where uh, shorebirds are foraging. So this gives us then, the, the managers now have, when we're designing areas to put trails in, we know how far away we have to keep it from pe features that we're trying to um, enhance for birds. Um, I know most of you are, are focused on fish, and I, most of my talk has been on um, birds, so I thought I'd kind of wrap up here with a little bit of fish data. So we, are, we expected the, the restoration to benefit fish, but we wanted to track and, and document that that was the case. 
So our researchers found over 40 different, different species of fish. The majority of them were native. Um, and basically they found there was a summer assemblage and a winter assemblage of fish. The winter assemblage of fish um, included long fin smelt, a California threatened species that seems to be doing very well in the winter down there, um, despite that it's decreasing numbers in the rest of the San Francisco Bay estuary. And basically the, the um, when the uh, water gets warmer in the summer and the salinities increase, you see a shift in species that are more tolerant of those higher temperatures and um, uh, higher salinities. And then in the winter it goes back again to a more winter assemblage being abundant. But we also wanted to see, well, what was, were they using the, the newly restored ponds compared to the sloughs? And this is just showing species richness and total number of species um, the, the black of the tidal ponds, newly restored tidal ponds, and the sloughs are in gray. And this is basically showing you that there's um, equal use of the tidal ponds as they are to adjacent sloughs, suggesting very quickly once we open up these ponds, the fisheries resources goes in and uses the area. And finally, we're um, concerned with climate change, uh, the effect on not only the biology of the entire San Francisco Bay and Delta, but specifically what effect will sea level rise have on our restoration project? And importantly, how can managers adaptively manage to um, ameliorate the effects of sea level rise and climate change? And so the managers have done several strategies. First, they were trying to restore wetlands earlier rather than later with the idea that um, a, habit, uh, a wetland that's already established has a better chance of um, withstanding sea level rise impacts than trying to start something up late in the century. Um, they've also been bringing an upland fill to increase the elevation, which kind of kickstarts the um, uh, uh, process to create a wetland. And we're also exploring using um, dredge material. Um, to enhance some of these ponds and increase the elevation. And we're also working to create high tide refugia like upland transition zones and marsh mounds within the, um, within the wetland restoration project. So uh, that's what I had. I tried to give you a little bit of a lot of things that we're doing. Um, and there's a whole slew of our uh, members from our science team that I want to thank for all their hard work and dedication. That's it. I don't know how much time we have for questions. Open it up to questions. No questions. Yes. Oh, can, I think you have to wait until. Do you know how much of your uh, deposited material is organic versus inorganic? That's question one. And question two is, Where's this inorganic material coming from? Um, they, they did look at, um, are you t you're referring to the sediment accumulation studies that we were doing in the ponds and the loose stored areas. Yeah, almost all of that is um, inorganic. In the first, uh, and it's pretty typical in the first um, initial uh, uh, restoration, almost all of it is going to be um, inorganic sediment coming in and accumulating. Once the vegetation takes hold, like now in the island ponds, we've got pickleweed and other uh, plant species coming in, then you'll start getting more of the marsh being composed of organic material. And what was your second question? So that is the big question, and we don't know um, exactly. Uh, we can't, you know, trace a little molecule to see it came, where it came from, but Historically, South Bay has been very um, uh, sediment rich. Uh, it's kind of a lagoon, you know, you go, once the tide goes through um, the Dumbarton Narrows, there's like a large lagoon, so just um, uh, geographically, it's kind of prone to having sediment accumulate in that area. Historically, there's, it's been had extensive mud flats, which also speak to the large amount of sediments that are down there. Um, it, it does not look like, at this point anyway, with our preliminary data, that it's coming from erosion of the mud flats. It's just this floating sediment that's um, in the water that's coming in on the tide and then settling out. But that's something that we do want to track very, very closely. Yes, Cliff. 
So we're having some record king tides this year with the El Nino and with the uh, warm temperatures in the ocean. Um, how are the ponds holding up? From what we can tell, fine. Um, we, you know, some of the ponds are fairly remote, so we can't get out there all the time and track it. We do have, we did develop some um, baseline data using satellite imagery for vegetation. And in the next couple of years here, we'll take those satellite images again um, and track to see what happened. But um, at least people that are on the ground and visiting those areas and the areas that we can see, like some of them are close to areas that still have levee access, um, there, there does not appear to be any impact from um, the, the water temperatures and the increased rains. And, you know, an estuary is an area that typically does have varying uh, fresh water versus salt water. The species in this area are adopted to having fresh, fresher water in the, in the summer, in the, excuse me, in the winter months when it rains and then more salinity in the, um, in the summer months. And because it's all tidal, um, you know, we haven't been impacted by the drought at all. The water's just gotten more saline in the, in the winter months. Work. How do all these, uh, these entities, uh, interdisciplinary people who are working on birds, uh, hydrodynamicists, people who know about sediment, um, obviously they have a lot to say to each other and, uh, you know, you, you said things like linear ponds are better than circular ponds. That was a conversation that emerged at some point. Um, mm -hmm. how, how do you guys interact? How do you do it? Well, uh, we had a whole meeting in December where we talked about that. Um, uh, well, I'm, a, I'm the lead scientist, so I get information from the scientist either through preliminary reports, preliminary data, drafts, et cetera. We don't wait for, for things to be published, and then I transmit that information to the managers. I'm on the management team. I attend all the management team meetings. We can also have calls where important late-breaking information will um, transmit directly to the managers. But more formally, we have these working groups that we, I've set up. There's a, a mudflat working group, a mercury working group, and a, um, a bird working group, basically, a pond management working group. So those groups um, are comprised of the researchers in those topic areas, as well as the managers. And we, sometimes we meet, you know, the pond management working group was meeting almost monthly uh, for the last couple of years. Now we've kind of, um, decreased that. The, the Mercury Working Group meets a couple times a year, um, sometimes physically, sometimes, um, you know, through a webinar. And that's where the latest results can be transmitted and the researchers can relay that to the managers or the managers can ask questions of the researchers. So those are the more formal ways, but a lot of it is me just transmitting the information. I might present um, a small synopsis, like just showing the results of a study um, to the management team at a management meeting. At all of our management meetings, we have a science update where I give an update. Sometimes it's a half an hour, sometimes it's, you know, the whole meeting, depending on what the issue is. So we have a lot of different forums that we've created for the managers to get the information from the researchers. We also have an annual researcher manager meeting where all day the researchers and the managers talk about various topics that you know, we organize. And then many of you went to our science symposium. We have that every other year, and that's a more in-depth look, kind of more geared toward the stakeholders and the general public, but our, our scientists get to present their results there as well. So, and I also do um, uh, these little um, kind of cliff notes of where I will send out email summaries of a couple paragraphs of a study that our researchers have done and send it out to our management team as well as to our science team. So the fish researcher knows what has happening with the bird research and vice versa. So that the science team is aware of um, what other people are doing. And we also have a lot of interdisciplinary teams like our, our mercury team is comprised of, you know, chemist, um, physiographic, uh, you know, bathymetric scientists, um, chemists, bird researchers. So um, many of our teams are interdisciplinary as well. The science team is. Did that answer your question? 
Uh, yes, we, I keep very busy <laughs> um, providing a lot of information to the managers, especially in the last year or two as we started getting results from the studies. Any other questions? I don't know how we are in time. No? Oh, did I see a hand go up? In terms of long-term management of, of the ecological values for which you've restored it for, I have some experience in, in the management of the Southern California ecological reserves and, and lagoons and things down there. Now, you restored it to a certain uh, certain stage. Is the long-term goal to hold it to where it is now or just to let it to go to whatever it evolves into? <laughs> We have been working, there's been a lot of, are you speak, speaking specifically to climate change and sea level rise? Is that the concern? Uh, just habitat changes, whether uh, you, you mentioned mud flats, uh, you know, in Southern California because of the tidal actions, are, which are more, more pronounced, massive dredging has to happen from time to time. And do you anticipate any kind of active management, you know, similar to what you might have to do on a, a wildlife refuge, uh, you know, in the valley? Sure. So for the areas that are restored to tidal marsh, no, we do not anticipate any major management actions needed unless there's, you know, an area that is really not developing and maintaining a marsh habitat as we would like, then there might be some intervention. But for the most part, it's a passive restoration and it's just let nature take its course. I will want to speak to just sea level rise. We have been, like I said in the last slide, concerned with um, modeling results show that there might be some drowning of marshes. So they've been trying to do things to increase marsh elevation to ameliorate those effects. Um, but with the managed ponds, that's a, little, a lot trickier. Those managed ponds have to be very heavily um, managed, just like in the Central Valley, um, the, uh, the duck areas, they have to manage the water, they have to manage the vegetation. Um, so that is a very intensive. Um, to maintain the ponds for the water birds, that is a lot of um, money and time to keep the levees intact, uh, open up the gates at certain periods of time to favor different birds, et cetera. So that is, that is still predicted to be uh, quite a bit of management. And I think that's why some people are favoring trying to make more of the ponds marsh because then that's less to have to um, manage for the refuge. But it's still going to be a big expense, so yeah. Any other questions? Comments? No, thank you very much. <laughs>